and then I'm going to, then I'll turn off the share for a second. So greetings to the mayor. Hello, I'm Lauren Meister, mayor of the city of West Hollywood. I have the privilege of being with you virtually today to recognize Hollywood Temple Bethel on the occasion of its 100th anniversary. In recognition of this great honor, the City of West Hollywood would like to present a proclamation to Rabbi Weinberg and all of Hollywood Temple Bethel staff and members. As you may know, Hollywood Temple Bethel was founded on January 26, 1922, to serve the needs of the Jewish community to gather for worship and celebration. During its early years, first Friday evening services were held in a bungalow on Wilton Place, just south of Sunset Boulevard. But as the congregation grew, by the end of the 1940s, the original site could not accommodate the increased membership. In 1948, a large lot was purchased on Crescent Heights Boulevard and noted architect Harry Hiller was recruited to design the corner sanctuary. That was completed in 1952. Today, Hollywood Temple Bethel continues to serve the needs of its congregants and remains a cornerstone of the community through its teachings of ethical and spiritual social values and community initiatives, including kosher meal giveaways, religious study and creative arts classes, bar mitzvah celebrations, and many other community-driven programs. Even throughout the pandemic, Hollywood Temple Bethel was able to provide worship services online and expand their reach beyond the city of West Hollywood and the city of Los Angeles. The City Council of the City of West Hollywood hereby recognizes Hollywood Temple Bethel for its commitment to serving the Jewish community in West Hollywood and surrounding areas. We also congratulate Hollywood Temple Bethel on its 100th anniversary. We wish you continued success many years into the future. Mazel tov. Thank you, Mayor. So, okay. So wait one second. Wait one second, because I'm going to show this close up first. Okay, give me a second. This is, are those, wait, they're seeing it on the screen first, Joe. Wait, wait, wait. Joe. Yeah. So I'm just do, pulling this up, City Bus Hall, you can see it, and then I'm going to hold it up. I'm going to do the stop share for a second after that. But you can see what uh, she was basically re reading from the proclamation and resolved. You can see that and all the signatures of the dignitaries of the city of West Hollywood. Because historically, we were very important in that, in the history of establishment of West Hollywood. There we go. So now, I'm gonna to go to stop share one second. And now, Joe, Joe, please go ahead and open up that one. That's right, so you can hold it so everybody can see and see if you can get in a, a close up. All right, there we go. Now try to, try to get it there. In the camera, that's it, okay. And you can back, shrink the lens uh, a little bit, a little bit more, a little bit more. That's it, hi, there we go. So it's beautiful, beautiful. Okay, good. Okay, a little bit, that's it. There we go, now, go there. Okay. Good. So now we see. It. Okay, that's number one. Number two, okay, is from uh, the city of West Hollywood, from the city of Los Angeles, City Council District Five. Thanks to uh, Council Member Paul Coretz. Uh, he was here when he was just still active on the West Hollywood uh, City Council and was beginning to run for office, and we had him here. And so this. Um, we, we didn't get a picture of it yet, but I'm going to post the actual picture later. So try to get uh, this one, a beautiful, uh, okay, beautiful plaque in honor from the city of Hollywood, city of Los Angeles. So thank you, Councilman Coretz. I told him. And that's because I told them what to put. <laughs> so, and I may actually get a little, I'm going to see if I can get a little declaration out of Councilman Coret's uh, video. We'll see. Okay, so now we can go ahead, sit down, go ahead. We, we're going to put these afterwards in a safe place. Or, okay, and I'm going to uh, post the pictures on, online. Uh, and we're going to go back to share screen. We're getting uh, people joining us from the outside. We're happy to welcome them. 
And so I, this is my, we're gonna be trying this. We're gonna see how it works. I'm going to be putting, uh, uh, gonna be putting Rabbi Cutler online with me. Uh, it's pre-taped to get it to work right. And I'm gonna be running a little bit back and forth, uh, segment by segment with him because as we're talking about the particular personalities involved, I realized that, especially for those of us who are still wet behind the ear, we may not know about them. Or even if we still remember them, we may not remember that much. So I, very short segments. And I made them very short segments because I want to make sure we're not running into anybody's copyrights. So we're going to start. I'm going to welcome Rabbi Jerry Cutler from the Creative Arts Temple. I'm going to introduce himself. I, I'm going to introduce us as the, the even couple. There was the Walter Matthau movie. I'm going to show you a clip of that. But uh, so that's the odd couple. I'm going to tell about Rabbi Cutler that we are the even couple. Uh, put him on here. So I start for on this computer. Go ahead. In progress, right? This is your legal notice that this is being recorded. Do you have a right to refuse uh, to be recorded? <laughs> oh, okay. Legal disclaimer. Wait, is this? Too much? Yeah. No, just take it off. Why do you need it? You need what? the light on me? Do you want okay, the light? Yeah, that at, a little light. Yeah, you'll oh, look better. Okay. That's a touch light. That's okay. it. That's fine. Yeah. So I did the same thing on my end. Okay. So let me start this. Um, well, ladies and gentlemen, Shabbat Shalom uh, to all of you who are listening in. Uh, I have Rabbi Jerry Cutler with me. He's the Rabbi of Creative Arts Temple. And uh, we go back a long, long time uh, where when I was full-time at Hollywood Temple Beth El, uh, Rabbi Cutler and Creative Arts Temple would meet on Friday nights uh, every month and run a wonderful service and a light and lively and really an unik Shabbat feeling for the service. And uh, then we did have a, a, you know, we tried a few years ago to pull something off like that again. And we ran for a few times, or you ran for a few times. So now, but you've been all, all along with Creative Arts Temple. Tell me a little bit about yourself, because I know it's, you, your father was a rabbi, am I correct? Very much so, yes. Yeah, and then your brother, you have a brother who's a rabbi also. He was a rabbi as well, yes. Yeah, so the, your father said, you're, you're all gonna be in rabbinical school, you're all going to yeshiva? No, it, it was just, uh, well, we went to yeshiva, of course, but he was a very orthodox rabbi, a very learned man, God bless yeah. him. And uh, he, we just assumed we would enter the rabbinate. Uh -huh. uh, even though I studied something else in college, uh, I went to rabbinical school and here I am. Uh -huh. So did so you... Yeah, Did go you ahead. go through working with any full-time congregations after you finished the rabbinical school? I had, uh, oh boy, I'll, I'll tell you exactly what happened. I had a congregation in, uh, New, in Connecticut, but I was the assistant to the rabbi. Uh, and that was lasted for a little while. And then I was offered a job at New York University where I had graduated from, and uh, to take care of, uh, be on the faculty and deliver some lectures and also take care of the program, the Jewish program for the Jewish Oh, you, you know what? We, we ran in the same circles. I just was there. I went to NYU in the Uptown Division. Well, that's where my office was, Uptown. What, what, Jewish Culture Federation? Jewish Culture Federation. Oh, my gosh. Oh, I my gosh. We are really walking around in circles because, yeah, I was then I was a little bit after you, but I was a student president. Actually, I had co-president, which was uh, co-president was Salem Catch. His father was Professor Catch. Uh huh. Well, I knew him very. Okay, okay. there we go. And later on, when I was in rabbinical school, I worked in the downtown campus in the in that office as the That's, director. Yeah, for well, I studied that. downtown. And and, uh, uh, Catch sent, Catch sent me uptown to... Uh, That's it. Oh, we're, 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 we're Lanzmann. I had no idea. After all these years, no. Look at that. It's, 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 it's a mishpocha. It is. So you remember the, 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 the dome? They, had, they sold the, the, the campus downriver, unfortunately. And not going to say downriver, but it's the Bronx Community College now. But they had the, the Hall of Fame right. building. 
you know, and they had the library, the dome, the double domed building. It was a dome yeah. inside of a dome. That was magnificent. And, and, yeah, and I remember as, as especially among the Jewish students, you walk in into the auditorium and there was a big uh, inscription in several languages, Reshus Chochma, Yeras Hashem, right? Reshit Chochma, the beginning of wisdom is here of the heavens. And um, so that that's it. Okay. That's interesting. Okay, yeah. my dear friend, my if Lanzman is true, yes. Yeah. So, then, where, so what happened after that? How did you go transition then out of rabbinics to was it ta talent management? Ah, uh, I, while I was there, I got a call to become uh, an associate editor of a motion picture magazine. And since I had my background had been, as you know, show business, I was in the Catskills for many years as a stand up comic. Uh, and I thought that would be great. So I told the Abe Koch, I, I'm leaving, I'm going up to, uh, to uh, edit a motion picture magazine. He knew that's where my. Uh, ah, I get it. Was. Yeah. So I uh, edited that and then became a personal manager. I met a lot of people, and before long, I was representing uh, Jackie Vernon, Stiller and Mara, Slappy White, and find Stanley Myron Handelman. Yeah. And as I got a call one day, they were interested in Stanley on Dean Martin's show. So I said, let's go out. We went, we moved. Uh, my wife and myself, and we had one daughter at the time, we moved to California. And here I am. Oh my gosh! Yes. Well, that's a good story. So, uh, and, and you found that if you you're dealing with one VIP at a time was easier than dealing with a congregation of a hundred VIPs at a time. Uh, it was uh, <laughs> many of them, and they came for one person to pray. Yeah. yeah. And since I uh, well, background is Catskills, so I was. Uh, kibitzing from the pulpit they all loved it and uh we built a very nice congregation with many uh, many celebrities right right so that's how you started with the performing arts uh, that was the first one that's right synagogue right. for the performing arts uh -huh. and i got into an argument once because uh it was yom kippur and someone had come in to say kaddish uh, in memory of, of their, I don't know of whom, but the president's wife, and I won't tell you who the president was or his wife, but I did go to school with them in NYU also. They all graduated, we graduated in journalism together. Oh. And uh, she said, no, don't let them in. We had cops there, of course, watching the, uh, the uh, people who came in and also keep out anyone who would disrupt. And they didn't let them in and someone had told me after i said you you can't do this someone regardless of how many celebrities we have someone wants to come in and say kaddish into a synagogue how dare you go? well we got into a big argument and i said that's it i'm, I'm leaving uh so oh. I left and i started the uh creative arts temple i see I see. Then here I was. Now we're uh, many years later, and God bless them. They're still we're still running. Oh, the I see. Uh, okay. So I know with create the performing arts there, uh, right now. Or I don't know who's still there, but for a while uh, the cantor was uh, Judy Fox, whose husband is Herschel Fox. Judy, yes. Uh, Judy uh, yeah. and and uh, Herschel, we're we're very different. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, my one of my cantors was Barry. Uh, Barry, what's his name? I forgot. <laughs> an actor, an actor, Barry Gordon. Uh -huh. Barry Gordon, who was, uh, he was in many films and TV series. He became my cantor. Uh -huh. uh, Alan Bly, who produced many, many shows, uh, uh, Sonny and Cher, and oh, et I even wrote for one of his shows, uh, comedy. Barry Gordon. Oh, he, my daughter tells me Barry Gordon played the rabbi on Curb Your Enthusiasm. Oh, oh my gosh. That I tell you. Well, he was my kid. He was wonderful, a wonderful yeah. singer and his own guitar. Yeah. Uh, th those were uh, wonderful years. 
Yeah, I remember so far. Yeah, when you were with us uh, by, back in the nineties, you had mm -hmm. the Porter. Um, can't, was it was the name of Porter? I forgot. Hale Porter, yeah. Hale Porter, that's it. I remember. Yeah, I actually had him do one Shabbat service uh, for yeah. us. Also, Hale had a beautiful voice. Hale yeah. was also. I in fact, I booked him into Jacques Brel is the live. At, what is it? Jacques Brel is the live. Oh, at, oh, yeah. And he started in it, and I, and his, he had an agent who couldn't do it. I said, leave it to me. I called him up. I got him the job. And so he was my cantor and he took off to, I lost him to Jacques Brel, but he toured for a long time. And uh, he came out to California with his wife to live. And sadly he died before I, oh. I, I visited him before he did pass on, oh. I was able to see him. He was a wonderful guy, wonderful guy. I knew him in the Catskills. Yeah, wow. Yeah, yeah he was my cantor in the Catskills also. Oh my gosh. Yes, when I did high holiday services, he was my cantor. Oh, that's yeah, the man with a great sense of humor. Oh, well. uh, yeah. But that's out funny. here, I, as you know, I met uh, many people, many, many celebrities. Now I'm going to start with the first, <clears throat> just an introduction, so we know who we're talking about. And so I'll just introduce you the very first one, just my notes here about Isaac Sidney Caesar. Sid Caesar. I don't know how many of you remember Sid Caesar on TV. When I was a kid, I used to love the show. Sid Caesar with Imogene Coca, uh, American comic actor and writer, career spanning 60 years, two pioneering 50s live shows, the Your Show of Shows, and uh, which was a 90-minute weekly show with 60 million viewers, and Successive Caesar's Hour both of which influenced many later generations of comedians. The writers, that was very important. He became a lab for the later great comic writers. Uh, Mel Brooks, Neil Simon, Larry Gelbert, Carl Reiner, Michael Stewart, Mel Tolkien, Selma Dine, and Woody Allen. They all got their starting with him. And Steve Allen said of him, SIDS was the show to which all comedy writers aspired. It was the place to be. So I'm going to give you a clip so you can have a sense of what Sid Caesar was like. I'm going to do a very short clip. Let's see if I can get this to work. There we go. Very short clip. Hope the food is good, because I'm it's starved. <laughs> well, let's dig in. <laughs> What's the matter with you? People look at you, it's not nice. Can't you wait till the waiter comes? Charles, these are health food hors d'oeuvres. They're the blossoms of the Palapaka plant. The Palahuka water? The Paula Parker plant, they're loaded with sodium oxide. Very good for your ankles. Try one. And if you like them, I'll get a bouquet. We'll keep them around the house for snacks. Yeah, that would be good. We go out. <laughs> Next time we go out, we'll eat separately. I'll eat at Pepito's and you can eat at the Botanical Garden somewhere. <laughs> okay. So, uh, anytime you've been to some of these health food restaurants, sometimes you feel like that. Don't quite carry the same thing. Yeah, that's right. So, you remember. All right. So, now let me go back and just continue that as reminiscence about Caesar. Carry it away. Go ahead. Rabbi. One of whom was. Uh... Sid Caesar. Sid was a member, and I want to tell you a story about Sid, if I may. Sure. And yes. I'm, I'm going back a few years. It was about about nine years, and a few friends at our temple, the Creative Arts, thanks to Lou and Fran Zygmunt. I don't know if you know Lou and Fran. Uh, they had uh, a yearly affair at the Beverly Hills High School, New York. New Yorkers, all New Yorker high schools got together and we had a great time uh, seeing the people we knew and new people we met. But at any rate, uh, they knew uh, uh, Sid and they prepared a Shabbat dinner at his house. So we went out 
and uh, they asked me to come, which I did. And uh, we had a uh, once a month Shabbat meal and a night of kibitzing at Sid Caesar's house. The reason we went to his house, he wasn't doing well. Now this is late in his career and late in his wife, in his life. He had buried his wife, Francis, uh, and he was alone. And thank God he had a son and a daughter, but his health was failing. So for a number of months, we would get together and bring some laughter and kibitzing and companionship for, for uh, Sid. Now his friends at Friday night, the Shabbat service, it would change, uh, but the regulars were Mel Brooks, Carl Reiner, mm -hmm. Monty Hall, Lainey Kazan, Joe Bologna and Renee Taylor, Connie Stevens, Dick Van Dyke even came. Oh, yes. <laughs> uh, Richard Benjamin and Paul Apprentice, uh, and, and every so often, we uh, these were the regular group, and we had uh, the, uh, John Voigt came one night, uh, so we had a lot of good people there. Now, the evening would begin, the Shabbat would begin by me welcoming everyone and giving them all a blessing, and then we would start the Kiddush, and who was the, the uh, person who did the, who sang the Kiddush? Theodore Bikel. Oh, my gosh. Now, I have never heard a Kiddush song like he sang this Kiddush. He also came and did a, a, a Pesach Seder, the most beautiful Seder I had about. My father used to give great, great Pesach Seders with all the Jewish actors uh, who came. He was very close with many Jewish actors. And uh, it, it was such a beautiful evening. Uh, after Theo finished, we'd sit down and we'd uh, eat, and Carl Reiner had a, a cup, regular drinking cup. It said, uh, a Jew's telling jokes, old Jews, it was a play on, uh, off Broadway at the time. So whoever handed, uh, got the cup, had to tell a joke. And Sid would sit there in his wheelchair at the table and have such a glorious time. He would laugh. He would, it, it was as beautiful a time as anyone has, has ever had. Um, the, the, uh, the, we never had a Shabbat meal as funny as we could at Sid Caesar. The Shabbat meal would last three hours, sometimes four, of everyone telling jokes. And whoever got the uh, cup would tell a joke. When it came too hard to tell uh, for Sid to even sit up, in his wheelchair, he would be in bed, and every so often, someone would go visit him. And I, I went to visit him, of course. And one time I did, it was very close to the end for Sid. And Sid was a history buff, and we'd always talk about history, German, the Germans and the Jews. I mean, he was so, so very knowledgeable uh, about the Holocaust. Well, everyone was, but he knew the intricacies and when it started and how Hitler ha had acted uh, and history in general. And I happened to mention to, him, mention to him, I said, Sid, you don't know when I first saw you. I didn't meet you yet, I just saw you. I went to my first Broadway show and that was, uh, a show called Little Me, and it starred Sid Caesar. I, I had never been exposed to a Broadway. I was a kid, I was still in high school. I was so thrilled. I, it, it, I couldn't believe me sitting in a show, which, and in this glorious show, it's wonderful, the music. I said, Do you, uh, Little Me, and I started to sing the song. And by now it was hard for him to even talk. So I was doing a lot of talking, but I started to sing. I only knew the first line. Uh, pardon me, miss, but I've never been kissed by a real live girl. That was his signature song. I didn't, I stopped. I didn't know the rest of the words. Sid Caesar picked up and he started, he came alive. He started to sing. He's from where I left off. He sang every verse of that song, which took a few minutes. I, and I couldn't believe it here. I was here 
an audience of one, the, perhaps the world's greatest entertainer, was singing for me, for Jerry Cutler, for his rabbi, yes, but I was still just Jerry Cutler. And I, I had never been so entertained in my life. And I will never, ever forget that day. Never, never. You know, for those of this <coughs> who are following or, or listening in, who are still wet behind the ears, just when I was a kid, I remember watching Sid Caesar on TV and he would have this routine where he would pretend to speak foreign languages. Yes. Oh, he and they was, were all variations of Yiddish or something like yes. that. <laughs> he, he double talked. He yeah. double talked every language. Was, and, uh, and it sounded he, real. Oh yeah, oh yeah. He 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 never hesitated. When we did the telethon, as you know, my wife and I, uh, yeah. Jeff, she produced it. I wrote it, the Chabad telethon. He came on, and I think the most money we ever got was when he was on. He yeah. and he did everything. He did his Yiddish. He did the Japanese. He, he was so entertaining, so entertaining. Yeah. Uh, we even had on Walter Matthau, who I love. Okay. So now, bring me to. Walter Matthau, and uh, Walter Matthau, just for those who don't remember him, or Walter John Matthau. Some of them didn't change the names very much, them, except for what we'll see. A lot of them kept variations of the original name. So Walter Matthau, American actor, best known for his roles in A Face in the Crowd, King Creole, and the coach in the uh, little League comedy, The Bad News Bears. And he was in 10 films co-starring with Jack Lemmon, you may remember also. And he became famous for the role in The Odd Couple on Broadway in 1965. And he earned a Tony Award for Best Actor. So this is a little segment from The Odd Couple. It was version number two, they did a follow-up. So this is a segment from it that I thought gave us a good flavor for Walter Matthau. And what are you doing this for? To be wanted, to get close to it happening one more time. The wick is almost out of feelings. All I want is for the candle to glow rather than curse the darkness. It's not going out, Oscar. Not yours, not mine. But I still have hope that out there somewhere we'll find the right lamplighter. You know, we just used so many metaphors, I forgot what the hell we were talking about. Good evening. Okay. So many metaphors. So now, go back, Rabbi. Take it away. Then Walter, I, I'll tell you a very fast story. I know you have many people but uh, to interview and to talk to yet. Walter Matthau. Uh, one day he said, would you like to come to, uh, to lunch with me? I said, sure, wherever you want, Walter. He took me to the Beverly Hills Tennis Club in the midst of Beverly Hills. I was never there. He took me in. It was a glorious place with uh, all the Beverly Hills people sitting around having lunch. And there's Walter. And hey, Walter, everyone waving to him as we came in. He said, OK, order what you want. I said, well, uh, I, I, I'm here, I can't eat much, uh, but uh, I'm kosher. Lard. He said, how about a salad? I said, good. I said, I've got a good, a good spinach salad. I said, it sounds great. He got the spinach salad, he came out, and as I'm walking with him to the table, I look at the spinach salad, and I said, I asked him, what's this red thing on top of the uh, spinach? He said, oh, that's bacon. I said, well, I, I can't eat that. <laughs> Well, Walter stopped in his tracks. He said, oh my God, he slapped his head. I didn't even think of it. That, yeah, that would be, of course not. He took the bacon from me and he went around to every table. Who wants to buy the rabbi's salad? I got the rabbi's salad here. Who wants to buy? Well, he went to every single table and he got the people who were bidding. <laughs> bidding on the salad. <laughs> And I forget how much money he got. I mean, it wasn't much. I, mean, I think it was famous high or something. But anyway, of course, Walter donated it to the temple. <laughs> but uh, it's, I have many highlights uh, like this of, of the, uh, these celebrities who were 
so wonderful and so giving. Um, and it, it, for me, this little kid from, from Brooklyn uh, and, and a schlock entertainer in the Catskill Mountains, to be with all these celebrities and stars. Uh, what a, and my father came. Uh, oh, I took him to, I was also a movie reviewer. And I took my father, God bless him, to a movie. And uh, I forget what, which movie it was. It was an adventure movie. And he, he loved it. And he's watched right as we were walking. I said, Gerald, tell me something. I said, what? He said, for this, you get paid? <laughs> I, said, <laughs> I said, yes, Papin, very well. And thank you. That's a good question. That's a good Jewish question. That's a good Jewish question. Uh, <laughs> going back to Sid Caesar for a second. Now, he had a whole staff of writers with him. And he, so he was the Mel, Mel arm school for them. all the great writers after that. Yeah, right? they all, they all uh, in, on their own, they all became uh, stars, really. Yeah. Uh, and one of his, the players, the little guy, uh, whose name is, uh, oh my God. Howard Morris. Who? Howard Morris. Ha thank you, How, that's why I have it here. My age, I'm forgetting. Howard Morris played the little guy. Uh, and always his, uh, his, his, his standby comic whenever he needed. He was right. always, he was a regular on there, but he was always the brunt of something. Right. And Howard was a beautiful man, a beautiful man. Uh, and he would do these sketches with, with Sid, which was so wonderful and so beautiful. And, yeah. uh, you know, Sid was known as a starker. This guy had a stark. He was he was very strong. He worked out. He looked great. Huh? And uh, he uh, one day he there was an argument with a cab driver. And the cab he wanted to go somewhere, and the cabby was very insulting. Uh, and he had his window down, yelling at at Sid and uh, telling you that I, I, he might have been anti semitic I don't remember exactly. But I know that Sid reached in and pulled the guy at it through the window. Oh my God. He pulled him out and, and the rest of the, everyone came rushing because Sid would have killed him. They, they pushed him aside. He it was in New York? In New York. There's a New York cabbie? Broadway. You gotta watch what you're dealing with. Uh, <laughs> and the LA cabbies must be easier going. <laughs> yeah, you know, here is, is no comparison. Oh, no. There's also a story of, uh, he got into an argument with Mel Brooks and they had an office on, on a very tall building in New York. Uh, they were on maybe the uh, 30th floor or something. And he got into an argument <laughs> with, with Sid about a skit they were going to do. And uh, Sid said, no, this is the way it's gonna be. And Mel said, Mel was one of his writers. He said, no, this is the way I wrote it. As, as he came over, he grabbed him by the collar, he went to a window which was open and he put him outside the window <laughs> and everyone stood there, they were too paralyzed to move. He was holding uh, Mel outside the window and he was gonna try, Mel said, no, no, you're right, you're right, you're gonna do what you want. He pulled him back in. That, that, that would be fine for a Mel Brooks movie. Uh, oh, okay, so that brings me to the last of the figures we've got for this segment which is uh, Mel Brooks. So Mel Brooks is, is the one who has a very different Jewish name from uh, the, the, than the stage name. And that he was born Mel James Kaminsky, American comedian, filmmaker, career spanning seven decades, creator of broad farces and parodies. Among the best film comedies ever made were his. So there is, he just published, in fact, it's in the 80 or 90 something, just published his memoir, All About Me, and with Carl Reiner created the iconic 2,000-year-old man. Three of his films are ranked among the top 15 of 100 best comedies of the last century. So Blazing Saddles, number producers at number 11, and Young Frankenstein at number 13. So here, just for us to remember a little bit of Mel Brooks, here is Mel Brooks for the 2,000-year-old man. Yeah. Um, and he 
uh, gentleman came to his land and said, I'm so thirsty, may I have a little dipper milk? Ah. And he said, certainly, go over to the barrel. He not knowing that the barrel of milk had soured, ah. see? So this poor beggar man came to the barrel and opened up from the top and looked in and looked down and went, cheese! <laughs> cheese! That's, that's, that's the word. That was that's how the word I cheese see. came into being. It's very onomatopoetic. Yes, and that's the truth. Yes. yes. Now we don't use that anymore. No, no. Now we go in, we say to the grocery, I'll have cheese. You don't go, cheese! You scared of grocery. <laughs> Okay, so now you know the origin of uh, So, uh, let's go back. And we go into a discussion of Mel Brooks and then wrap up this segment with what is it that makes Jews funny? Uh, yeah, funny. he probably had it in there, but... Uh, and, and Mel Brooks, I, I love. Mel is a, is a dear friend. Yeah, he's a good neshama, this guy. Uh, we, I, I, there was an article I read, and, I, uh, and in it they, they asked him about his Jewishness, his background in Williamsburg. Do you have a rabbi? He said, yeah, what's his name? He said, Jerry Cutler was my rabbi. And it was in the paper. I forget which paper it was, the Forward, the English version, <laughs> the Times, one of the papers. And uh, I saw it. And when I saw Mel at Junior's, who was sitting and eating in the restaurant in Junior's in West LA, I went over to him and I said, Mel, thank you so much for mentioning, I know you have, the, the, the world is, everyone in the, in the world wants to be your rabbi, but you, you mentioned me as your rabbi. He said, uh, don't let it go to your head. You're the only rabbi I know. <laughs> it was my name that came out. So he gave me a lot of publicity. But he's a gentle soul who's so darn funny, needless to tell you. And Mel at the dinners uh, was, of course, very close with, uh, with, with uh, 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 Mel and Carl Reiner, and they used to do stuff. And they would do their, their, their bits together. And Sid would sit there and quell, because these are the people he started in the business. Wow. who re reached fame because of him and he would just stay, sit there and fell in his wheelchair. Once in a while you'd see a tear flow. Uh, it was a beautiful time in my life. Uh, I will never forget him and, and the people who took part of this uh, particular Shabbat evening. It was a great Shabbat with, which had to end one day and uh, his service uh, of course was uh, the, the service at the uh, uh, Mount Sinai was was uh, in the chapel was beautiful with everyone coming up and talking and he is, uh, Theo came up and played a song. Uh, it was such a beautiful. I'm getting chills thinking about it. Uh, but he was uh, one of the great, great, great talents comedic talents and such a serious man when we spoke about history in the Holocaust, he became so serious. This guy, he was a strong Jew. And people don't realize that, how these, most of these entertainers, Red Buttons, another one who was so strong. We're gonna go just one last segment, which is about five minutes, about we go into what makes these entertainers Jewish. And just introduce quickly to Red Buttons. And uh, he's, he's the one whose name is also very different from his stage name, Aaron Schwatt. Aaron Schwatt or Schwatt, uh, American actor, comedian, Oscar winner, Golden Globes winner from the film Sayonara. And also playing in films like They Shoot Horses, Don't They, Harlow and Peace Dragon. Played the private John Steele in the film, the the D-Day, the, the Longest Day was a great historic uh, movie about D-Day. So here, a quick clip of Red Buttons so we can see who he was. You 
won't believe this, folks. I never took a lesson in my life. I owe it all to LSD. Lock, salami, and donuts. Hey, have you heard the, uh, about the new... Uh, LSD, lock, salami, and donuts. Okay. So now let's go ahead about red buttons and being Jewish. Oh, and he would I'd have lectures between uh, uh, in Yom Kippur when we had the break before the Nila service. I always had someone or myself speak, and we read came to every single one of them for years, and he participated in uh, discussing. Uh, I, I want people to know that these people were not only Jewish in name and in feeling, they gave of themselves. And they were so wonderful and so proud of their Jewishness. Where are they today? They, these guys are gone and I don't find uh, not Have even- Do you see anybody among the young comedians that carry that kind of clout weight? No. Yeah. Who? Sasha Baron Cohen. Oh, well, well, Sasha Baron Cohen, but he's, uh, uh, he came to my services once and, or more than once, because he was very friendly with one of my uh, members from Israel. And uh, he, uh, I so looked at and there was davening with the, uh, the Talas up in, uh, over in Cup, you know, over his, uh, oh, yeah. it was shuffling. Yeah, it yeah. was so beautiful to see him. And who, yeah. No one might, we they all well Talasim, but none of them put it over their head and would shuffle back and forth. Adam Sandler. Adam Sandler is another one, my yeah. daughter. He's got the Hanukkah song. Seth Rogen, Seth Rogen, had, he had that uh, kosher pickle movie. The guy that yeah, was doing yeah. that. Uh, yes, uh, he, uh, well, he's proud of his Jewishness, Seth yeah. Rogen. Uh, but I don't see him, uh, at, I don't see him being as, as um, strong and as uh, committed to his Yiddish kite. Yeah. Mayim Bialik. Uh, who? Mayim Bialik. Oh, Mayim Bialik. Well, Mayim Bialik. Well, she's very Jewish, yeah. Uh, we're, we're too liberal. I mean, you can't get more Jewish than a name like Mayim or Bialik. Yeah, yeah. and God bless her, she's now hosting uh, Jeopardy. Uh, she, uh, she's one, I, I haven't met her yet, but hopefully one day I will. Yeah, who? Tiffany Haddish, yeah, the black. Uh, oh yes, she got both sides. Around with a Magen David on right. her. Uh, so we're, we're going places, but I want the children of these performers I just mentioned. Right. I want them to be active, and really uh, that that's hard. Yeah, I saw Sarah Silverman started to stand up also. Yes. About, should a, a Jew, the idea of a Jew face, you know, should it, and somebody acting a Jewish part. Should they have a Jewish uh, punin, a Yiddish punin? Yeah, well, uh, actually, Chelsea knows it better than I do. Uh, and uh, you were telling me some things about uh, uh, Sarah Silverman. Yes, Sarah Silverman is thoroughly through and through Jewish. And uh, it's, God bless her as well, uh, which is good to see. But I want to see the, the current generation who are coming up and taking over. Uh, I want to see their Yiddishkeit, and that's what I'm missing. That's interesting. Very interesting. I, I would let, love... let me talk about, you know, you know, comedians. Okay, so next week we'll go into a little bit more, and also the question, what makes Jews funny? Are Jews funny? You mentioned somebody passed away. Who is it? A young one? Boom. Oh, Saget, Saget, Bob Saget. And their questions about whether the family autopsy, their problems with that. Yeah, it's problematic. Um, all right, well, that's, let's think of that. I, I'm going to break now. Thank Rabbi Cutler. Those of you who are joining in from uh, Creative Artists, uh, uh, Creative uh, Art Temple, a wave to you. Next week, we're going to continue because we go into uh, what is it? Are Jews funny? And then uh, we've got uh, three other 